Listening to Off Planet Radio at OffPlanetRadio.com. And uh, I guess where we start with this is where we left off the last time. If you're listening to this in order, and you really probably should, uh, you've probably listened to uh, the tape that I did with Christine Anderson, and uh, we began to break out the details of what I kind of call the evolution of Corey Good, uh, Mr. Goodbar, and his buddy Mr. Peanut David Wilcock. And the whole debacle of how this thing is playing out. And I didn't really set out to do this. I mean, like, you know, there was no plan. But when my Facebook post got posted on the Project Avalon, and then Bill Ryan picked it up and used it for his own purposes, I was sort of drawn into a situation where I felt like we not only needed to look at this, and look at it at least somewhat objectively, as objectively as you know we can be about it, um, but also to put some things on the record. So what I've done is with Christine and now with my guest today, we're, we're, we're basically going to primary sources, which is something almost nobody in this, this, this whatever you want to call it, alt media, you know, garbage can, puke barrel of uh, assorted nutballs, we're, we're just trying to get through the narrative in a way that then you can decide. Because right now, the only thing that's on record is Bill Ryan's um, rehashing of ancient history and the interview that he did with Dark Journalist, which was really just more rehashing. And so in keeping with the idea of the primary source people, today we have Shane the Ruiner with us. Shane was pretty much there from the inception of this thing, and brother, uh, let's unravel it. How you doing, Shane? All is well. Another day in paradise, as I like to say these days. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it is. It is paradisical. <laughs> and doing well. Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, I've, I've been dragged into it since day one. Um, I kind of was there through the inception of it because I was kind of talking to David and Corey before um, Corey was very well known to the public. Uh, one of the first kind of involvements I had with it was Bill and Christine had recorded some audio with Corey, uh, the first interview that he, he gave, I guess. And uh, Bill had put up uh, what ended up being part one of that interview, uh, edited it, put up. And and I guess there was a second or there was more to the interview that they wanted to get published. And there was some back and forth about whether or not the audio was salvageable. So I had reached out and said, "Hey, I can I can fix that. Send it my way. I'll, I'll edit it together. I'll take all the all the blips out of it and make it, you know, something that people can listen to." And so I did that, and that was kind of where it all started for me, anyways. And um, in the process of that, Corey had actually introduced me to David Wilcock, and him and I had spent a lot of time speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, I kind of watched as the the Corey Good show as it has become uh, started as something pretty simple, not unlike anything that many other people have said, and just kind of all of a sudden there was the blue avians and there was the sphere beings and there was all of this kind of nonsense that came along with it, and uh, I kind of uh, immediately started count, kind of calling it bullshit because it just it made no sense. It sounded to me like something I knew as a as a mind control program, to be honest with you, Pro mm -hmm. Project uh, blew in many different forms, yeah, yeah. and and kind of started calling that out. Um, it's it's tie into the law of one. I was also very kind of outspoken about because I understand who wrote that and why they wrote that and why it's out in the public and who it's given to as the truth and why. And it is all mind control and it is all bullshit. And so I had said all of that, and um, that kind of started a little bit of a, a friction between <laughs> the two of us, obviously. So, um, and from there, uh, obviously, I had started writing the blog, and people were Googling certain ca keywords 
trying to you know research Corey's story and, and they found the one that I wrote on avians and the rest is kind of history um, everyone started kind of coming to me as being a weapon against the man and I just like it, it was a role that I don't want and refuse to take I don't I don't mean to be that at all I mean my opinion is my opinion it's based on mm-hmm. X Y and Z and whether or not you feel the same doesn't really matter to me um, that's my opinion and so, uh, yeah, so dragged back into it again now that okay. uh, this Bill has done what he has done of uh, reposting your post. And um, my name started getting thrown around in there because there was a screenshot that I had provided of a conversation Corey and I had. And now there's this back and forth nonsense about whether or not I edited the conversation. Corey put out the same conversation, so clearly I didn't edit it. Right, right. <laughs> that doesn't, you know, right? Um, and then the video in question as well is another kind of data point that a lot of people are hitting on. It's something I saw but never had in my possession, never claimed to be giving it to anybody, never said I was going to give it to anybody. It's something that was shown to me for my own information. I don't hold it as a, a true data point because there's no verification of it. It's just something so I saw. So explain right? what the video is just, just for people who may not know the backstory to that shame. Basically what it is is a, a video clip of a couple people, uh, Corey and uh, someone else in a room coming up with this story and um, actually, you know, fabricating parts of it and trying to twist it. Oh, no, no, we need to do this. We need to do that, that, that kind of a thing. It was very short. It was very brief. It was just kind of enough to make me go, oh, OK, yeah, that's exactly what I thought it was. And um, when I mentioned it, it was kind of in passing originally. I didn't really think it would ever blow up to this point. Um, but I guess I just wanted to kind of put it on record that said video is not in my possession. I will never be releasing it to the public because I've never had it to do so. It's pretty much a throwaway data point at this point. Um, you can either take me at my word or not, and I, it doesn't matter to me whether you do or not. And you probably shouldn't because it's not something that everyone can see. We can't all, you know, sit around and we'll watch the video and go. Yeah, but okay, you're not the one it. that brought it up in this particular round either, so. You know. Well, that's true, and that, that's the only reason I'm speaking to it again is because of the fact that I've been dragged back into it, and, and so I just repeat it. Well, that is the point of the whole thing. You got, you you basically bailed, what six eight months ago, disappeared from the entire scene, and went off to live what I hope was a much quieter, happier life than some of us have that have to do this all the time or do this all the time. I guess I don't really have to do it, but. When this whole thing erupted, it was like uh, there was a whole bunch of dirt that got thrown into the mix as a way to convolute the basic narrative. And all uh, your name was drug in almost immediately because, again, there had to be a nemesis. There had to be a third party because it had the, 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 the perfect term, and you coined it a while back, is deflection. This has all been about deflection. Yeah, I don't know, like, I mean, I understand why I got brought back up into it, because I, I played a part in that, but I guess just um, this ongoing thing of people trying to use me against Corey, it was Corey who said that I was an Illuminati disinformation agent sent to, to discredit him. I never said I was, and I never set out to do so. If I had have set out to do so, I probably would have tried a lot harder and done a better job. Um, I, I've really not done anything. The only time I ever respond is when he's speaking directly to me, like on that uh, last Stillness in the Sto- uh, Storm blog that he posted. I replied to that directly to him, directly to the points that he was making about mm-hmm. me that were directly not true. Um, he likes to say things like this, this, and this discredit everything he says. Well, if that's the case, Corey, here's a PDF full of you doing way worse than that. And I guess by your own standards, you've discredited yourself. But that's got nothing to do with me. And so stop bringing my name into it when you know that I don't care. So I, you got introduced to David Wilcock by Corey. I, I, And my understanding, and and again, we're running, you haven't talked to Christine. There's been no crosstalk between the two of you or the three of us. I basically contacted Christine and said, say, since since this whole thing has gone this far down the road, and I consider you to be the, the person that did this in the beginning, you did the first, which was not even really an interview. It was Christine sitting down and talking to Corey in his home in Texas, in what be, then became 
the interview. But since you were there, since you were eye to eye and you saw the whole thing, let's put this down on the record. And obviously there's commentary, there's opinions. That's all part of the mix. And it's kind of the same way, you know, with you, Shane, is it's just putting together some kind of some kind of narrative here that gives people a better understanding that what has been presented in the public eye is what I'm calling basically entertainment business at this point, that this was somehow this was this was an opportunity for some people to basically push the envelope and create a production. So my understanding is that in the background, there was sort of a quasi bidding war going on over Corey. I'm not sure how that works or what that means exactly. My understanding is that David Wilcock, Kerry Cassidy, Bill Ryan were all players attempting to somehow corral Corey Good as a commodity. Is that your understanding of it as well? Um, I, I can't really say that it's my understanding other than that's what it appeared to be, yeah. right? Like that's, uh, if you kind of watch the way it all went down, I mean, um, not to say that any one of them were trying to maybe, or maybe they were trying to get the exclusive Corey Good material, but at first it was all on Avalon, obviously. Yeah. Corey had his fallout with Bill and then it moved over to another forum. And it was during that time that David was kind of picking it up and moving it over to the TV station. Um, and as far as I know, I don't, I don't really know what Carrie's involvement in that was. All I know is what I've spoken with her about. It doesn't really sound like she was bidding to get to his information or anything. It actually sounded the opposite, that Corey was con contacting her, mm -hmm. asking her to interview him. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, from kind of what I observed, that seems to be true. Again, I can't know for sure, but um, it did definitely seem like almost like this little battle for exclusive exclusivity between the two parties. David Project Wilcock, Avalon, yeah. David Wilcock, I mean. Yeah, and David Wilcock at that point. So here's where I'll kick in. This, what year are we talking about here? 2014? 2014, 2015, yeah, in that yeah, ballpark. Okay. Um, because David Wilcock was shopping for basically material at that point. I know that from independent parties that have nothing to do with this conversation as a personal communication to me when I was out in Boulder, Colorado in 2013. So, you know, that's what I'm putting on the record. I was, I was made aware at that time that David Wilcock was pending being brought into what was then Gaia, is now Gaia TV, and that he was basically looking to develop material for a series. So, you know, here again... And during the time that I spoke to him, like when I got to know David, that is what he was doing, was he was getting ready to uh, bring a bunch of new material to Gaia at the time. And uh, that's part of why he wanted to talk to me. We had talked about doing some video interviews at, at that time, and I wasn't really comfortable with it. And uh, Corey ended up taking that ball and running with it. So. so, I mean, you know, beyond that, we just speculate. So I just threw that data point in as a way to say that, yes, I, I, I was aware of this. And later on, when I talked to you and I saw some of the narrative, it was pretty obvious that, yes, there's nothing wrong with that on the surface. I mean, I don't have a problem with a researcher putting together material for a series. That's basically what they've done with ancient aliens for a long time. And, you know, you can argue about whatever you want to say about ancient aliens. I don't think much of it myself. I don't think much of reality TV in general or what's being presented. But it does look to me... And right from the beginning, I think all of us kind of sensed that there was a, a, a great deal of, let's just say, embellishment that went into the story of how this all evolved. And maybe where we can, can go with this is I'm very aware of people who recover memories coming out of projects, traumatic situations, SRA, um, people that are suffering MPD, DID, and all the associated syndromes that go with mind control programs. So there, there is a process to that. And I always allow for the fact that it's an imperfect process, that memories can be recovered, that may in fact be implanted, false memories, screen memories, and that, you know, most of the time in my estimation, 
based on doing this for, well, about eight years, that the best narratives are generally the most broken in the sense that they don't have a linear definition and they don't have all of the color that you would want from your Hollywood production of things. So when, when we look at it from this standpoint, this was a rather rapid development based on the narrative that's presented in the first interview, what occurred in the second interview and the way that the whole thing spun out from there. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's a, there's two sides to that. I, there, there are cases where people, it is just a matter of memory coming back later on. And there's also this case of it being a business and people making money off of it. And I mean, there's, there's no secret that in that particular case, a lot of money was being thrown around. I mean, there was public Facebook posts about people trying to donate him more than $10,000 at one shot. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, that kind of puts it into this other category where I like to consider that what these people are doing are kind of just creating new material in order to keep up their business and to maintain their following and to make the production bigger and better and brighter. And, um, I mean, I can only speculate what goes on in someone in, in David's mind. Um, but I, I do believe in Corey's mind that he's well aware of the fact that that's exactly what he's done and is doing and isn't stopping because it's making, it's working. It's working. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's working. working. You no, and, that's... It, and I don't know how much you've looked at. I mean, look, I basically have ignored the whole thing for two years. And the only reason I had occasion to even think about it was Emily Moyer, who is uh, my co-host and producer, sent me the uh, Contact in the Desert uh, poster that had Corey on the front of it. And she said, hey, check this out. What do you think? And it, it, some of that's background material on the things that Emily and I talk about. And, uh, you know, we, we're both very much of the opinion that what we're seeing in all of the showbiz drama is very much agency scripted material that's being put out there to obscure actual disclosure and to also create um, cults of personality and, and lure people into a false sense of hope using what I did describe in my Facebook post as a cult, as basically the Blue Avian's message is nothing more than a third party form of believism that lures people into thinking that humanity is so special that these creatures have blessed us and bestowed us and that we can now ascend freely because they've spoken which as you and i both know ain't the state of the, the galaxy or the world or the universe or anything else no and it's definitely not a message we haven't heard before so there's that to consider um <laughs> Yeah, the the production behind it is kind of what the giveaway is, you know, because it, it's I, it's too polished. It's all this CGI. It's all of this candy. It's bubble gum. It's really not anything. And the way that I understand that these things work is like you know, once they see an opportunity, they like to jump on it and ride it out and. So what I see that they've done with this sphere being alliances, it's been an opportunity to do something that I know I've been talking about for a long time, and that is like to try and discredit everything else that's going on. And I mean, it's it's happening in so many avenues right now. We've got these like metabunk like websites out there, debunking everything, Snopes, everything. It's just it anything that's conspiracy or anything that's beyond the norm is being thrown into the same bucket with flat Earth and and everything else that people just cannot accept and sounds crazy to the average person. And because of that, a lot of actual insight is being lost. And that is an agenda. That is part of why this is being blown up into what it is and why these TV stations come along and pick this stuff up and run with it and, and basically pervert the, the message that's within it and the, and the people within it until it's so just disgusting that the average person comes along and looks at it and says yeah the, those people are just all crazy and that's where we're at it's working it's unfortunate but it is working yeah it is working and it's and it's working at a time when you know from where i sit which is as much grassroots as i can keep it i mean i, I every 
I guess every few months I, I kind of re-examine and go, you know, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Why am I still here? Um, why am I still talking? And even if I walk away for a while, I get pulled back into it. And the point of it is that what really pulls me back into it is I see where people are at. And I'm talking the man on the street, the woman on the street, the people in my own family right now um, that have contacted me as a result of doing these shows. And it's basic stuff. It's, they want to know about, the, they want to know what's going on in the sky because they've actually started to look up and went, you know, that doesn't look like a cloud. That really doesn't look good at, good at all. And what the hell happened to the sun? And so, you know, these are, I, I call them base level entry points because they're the most observable. They're the most accessible for people. And it's the place where we can kind of pull them into a zone and talk about it and say, look, I, you know, maybe you grew up your whole life believing that your government cared about you and was going to take care of you and that they'd never lie to you. But here's the, here's the truth of the matter. You look up in the sky and you see planes right now bombing the living hell out of our atmosphere. That's an undisclosed program. There's no mandate for that. Nobody ever voted for it. There's no publicly disclosed funding. We don't even know who's doing it. And nobody has ever told you why they're doing it or how long they've been doing it. And so it's, to me, it's kind of like the most fundamental thing is to get people to that point. Not because I want to scare the hell out of them or confuse them or hit them with a bag of woo-woo, but because if they look up and they wake up, then they can start to ask the questions that are important to them. And they can bring in to the conversation at their own comfort level the facts that they need to integrate for their own reality, which I think is the only way anybody ever wakes up anyway. So this gigantic circus that has been fomenting for, as nearly as I can tell, over a decade, because I've been raging about it for seven years, uh, was basically erected as a big tent to pull people in, um, divide them according to their interest groups, you know, uh, what, what they call them in marketing affinity groups, and then divide and subdivide them to the point where they became predictable, marketable, and controllable. Do you agree or disagree with any of that? Absolutely agree. I mean, it's it's evident in front of our face. It's exactly what has happened since this movement, because this movement didn't start with the Internet. It just kind of took on a different type of life on the Internet since this alternative media community, whatever we want to call it, has you know, started growing on the internet. We've watched that happen. We've watched, you know, this divide and conquer of different personalities coming in, uh, infighting of whose information is valid and whose isn't, and his doesn't line up with mine, so therefore he's a shell and he's this and he's that. All this nonsense that all it really does is further traumatize the people who are coming here looking for a path for healing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I guess we we kind of go because you wrote the Ruiner blog. You started writing the Ruiner blog around this period of time, and it needs to be said. And I just repeated this to somebody on Facebook last week uh, when they asked, you know, about the Ruiner, and I basically said, "Look, that that material was never supposed to be read by the general public. There was a very specific reason why it was written. It got pulled into." the context of the Big Ten as a result of what you just explained earlier. Basically, the Ruiner blog became kind of a, 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 I don't want to say a sideshow act, because it wasn't that, but it got pulled in in a way that I think was, for people like me who read it initially, you know, I looked at it with open eyes, but I was also looking at it with eyes that have seen a lot of this material before, although that material had some rather unique aspects to it. But I think for most people, the context for the Ruiner blog was, number one, it wasn't written for them, and number two, it was pulled into the conversation that paralleled this Corey Good story so that even if people read it, it was already discredited by that sort of association. Yeah, that and like I said earlier too, everyone wanted to use it as a weapon. Like um, a lot of the reason why it started being posted and reposted was because of the one that kind of pointed out the project and behind that. And I'd, I'd say that if that didn't ever happen, like if 
if the if the blue avian story wasn't there nobody would have even seen the blog and it probably never would have been blown up and brought into all the forums and all the facebook groups and you know saved to pdf and shared around i don't think any of that would have happened if it wasn't for this one part and that's definitely was never my intention and has been kind of the bane of my existence ever since <laughs> um, yeah, that was... but uh yeah like i've said that many times like i I had a specific purpose in mind, and this was not the purpose. And that's why when everyone started coming to me wanting to interview me uh, against Corey, I kept saying no. You know, like it's it's really just been his inability to keep my name out of his mouth that keeps me talking about him. Otherwise, I wouldn't I wouldn't bother. You know, and it probably needs to be said. You know, my point in calling this out. Uh, on my original Facebook post, I actually changed the title of that because the original title of that post was um, The Face of a Cult. And I didn't like that because it personalized it. So I, I changed it to image. I, I, I talked to Emily about this. And I said, you know, I didn't want to make this about the person who is... James Corey, who is actually, as I understand it, his real name, Corey Good, as he's publicly known. I want to make it about what has happened in this scene. I want to make it about the fact that I honestly think there's exploitation going on. And while I believe that he's willing in this, I also think we have to understand that anybody that's compromised also is heavily influenceable, if that's not a word it is now. Um in terms of participating in something like this. Plus, who among us can honestly look in their own soul and not say, if somebody came and offered you a bag full of money, would you, would you do this? I mean, would I do it? No, I wouldn't do it. I'm past the point of temptation for that because I've lived longer. But, you know, I, what's in the hearts of men sometimes is a little more difficult to parse but I want to hold out for the good that's in people, too. So this was never really about calling Corey out. It was about calling out what has now become apparent in the people that I've talked to. Because along with you and Christine, I also had a chance to talk to Alfred Lambermont Weber about this. And he went on record with some people that he also thinks are compromised. And we've all been compromised. I've been compromised. You've been compromised. We've all been slandered. We've been libeled. We've been lied about. I mean, that, I just consider that to be even part of this whole dirty game that we have to play. Well, it absolutely is. And I don't know, it always seems to me that the people who kind of get shielded from that are the ones that are causing the bigger problems. Um, the people who aren't, you know, being called out for their, or being held accountable, I guess, to what their testimony is, are the, are the people who are, you know, the poster images, as you've put it for those cults and for those um, movements. But I think it, there's two, there's a couple different sides to that because as much as like, yes, there's potential for people to be compromised, there's also the potential for people to just exploit. And, you know, sometimes a shitty person is just a shitty person, as I like to say it. <laughs> Some, sometimes it's not about being mind controlled and it's not about anything else. Sometimes it's just money. Sometimes it's just fame. Sometimes it's just attention. Sometimes it's just something else to do. And it doesn't always have to be some satellite in the sky controlling their actions. Um, and the way I feel about this particular situation and the people involved is that it, every time someone comes along and says, you know, he's compromised, he's mind controlled, he's this, he's that, we're actually doing a discredit to ourselves. Why can't we just call a shitty person a shitty person? Why can't we just call a shitty situation a shitty, shitty situation? Why do we have to keep maintaining that, oh, well, they're, you know, I, I like to look for the good in everybody as well, but sometimes the bad takes over the good. I do believe everyone has good in them. I believe Corey is a good person underneath it all probably as well. But his actions and his behavior since he's taken on this role have not been that of a good person. He's not been kind to people. He's not been fair. He's not been honest, and those are not the results of a good person. And when it comes to programming or manipulation of anything, like there has to be something there to manipulate. If you don't have that tendency within you, they can't exploit it. They can't manipulate it. 
So at the end of it, it's still a personal responsibility to work out those things within ourselves so that we don't, we don't play their game or we don't become a, a part of their game or a tool within their game if that is what they want. I do maintain that in this situation, it's not about mind control, it's about money. It's about attention and it's about the stuff that comes along with a TV show. And um, I've... I, part, I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> It'd be much easier to just be wrong about that. But that's what I believe this is. And I think we need to be responsible for ourselves and put a stop to it when we can. And just, you know, you vote with your money, right? So don't pay for the TV station that's supporting it. Or don't donate to the the PayPal account. Or don't repost it, you know? <laughs> These type of things all add up. And that's that's how we're... That's how we can take kind of control or uh, well, I'm not sure what the right word is, but responsibly participate in it. It's basically being an educated consumer of information. And I hate to use that term because it's a marketing term. Here again, you know, we're left with the language of the culture we live in. And But I'm glad you said that because there's a part of me that and this again, you know, I have people I talk to on an ongoing basis, and it's kind of an examination thing. Do we even want to go there with this? I mean, like I said, like you, I kind of got pulled into something that was a lot bigger than I ever expected it to be. We're a month down the road on that Facebook post. And I mean, the first couple of weeks, I did nothing but answer emails and Facebook messages. And a, a very long, you saw it, like 250 blocks down underneath the initial post of just everything you can imagine that could come with this and you know people contacting me for comments and media and I was like this was never an article it was an opinion it was my opinion just as you know anybody does on Facebook I mean I kind of merged my personality side with my you know my my podcast broadcast thing, but that's what this is. I'm not a corporation. I'm not a professional. So I can say things in a certain context, and so can you, that isn't attached to some corporate responsibility bullshit. But when you get pulled into the, the tale of something that has taking on a gravitation field to where we then have, you know, it's circulating through all of these different forums and groups and stuff, and people who don't even know who the hell I am, wondering who is this guy and why is Bill Ryan talking about him. It's a different situation because I don't really want to publicize Corey Good. I mean, I'd rather not, you know what it's like. It's a negative feedback aspect. People go, ooh, they're talking about it. Let's go look at this. Well, I don't want to do that either. But it's with, the same for me. Like every time I do respond to him, I'm being a little bit hypocritical because I don't want to. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, I mean, and, that, but it, I, I, after, you know, it's been fucking two years, excuse my language, of the same nonsense. And it's just a big circle. Like people seem to forget that we've been through all of this already. All of these data points have already been put out before. All of this information has already been shared around. And even the, the PDF thing, like I, I mentioned it, uh, I think it was on your post there, and then people were asking me for it. I never kept it, but then as soon as I said I never kept it, I had a bunch of people saying, hey, well, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, so that PDF is actually going to be linked to this show. You'll be able to download it. You can look at it for yourself. Shane didn't write it. I didn't write it. The person who did compile that information doesn't want to be known, and we're going to respect oh, it. Was a, it was a group of people. Like I remember when it happened, it was a group of people all doing the same thing. There was various versions of it, and it got uh, amalgamated down into one more concise version is what had happened. Because a lot of people who were interacting with him during that time were seeing this story develop. Yeah. You know, Because there are... You know, there is a history to this that started on Project Avalon and got moved from Project Avalon, or it morphed within Project Avalon. I mean, I know that there's a, I think it's one of their moderators there, Jake, he's always posting about the fact, well, look at what he said a year ago. Look at what he said two years ago. And now look at what he's saying. Like, he's he's been coined or been quoted as having calling it a business. You know, so it's it's not like anyone's making this up, but it's not like it's not there for anyone to go find. It just, it seems to be... And this is where it starts to really feel like something that's, you know, mainstream media PR campaign like. It seems to be like all this stuff gets buried and they take another shot at it. 
everything falls out of the you know current memory and then they take another round at it but it's the same stuff i mean all of these same points have been made and remade and discussed and discussed again it's just it seems like you know an audience comes in they they consume it and they realize hey this is maybe something i don't need to pay all my attention to and they move on and then a new audience is needed so they just regurgitate the whole happenings again yeah, and I know so, I'm getting tired of it. No, <laughs> I, I, mean, sure. Lisa, I, I realized that when I began to look at the people who basically gang stalked me for about four days after the initial post went out. And I did a little bit of diligence on that, looked at some of the profiles and stuff and realized, you know, this is fresh meat in the marketplace. A lot of these people don't have the history that I have, that you have in terms of being able to actually go out and even know what Project Avalon is, much less be able to go in there, search through archives, go back through the old forums and things like that. And really marketing relies on that. I mean, that's how you have product life cycles is that you rebrand, you relaunch, you reformulate. These are all ways that you keep, you know, products circulate, circulating on the shelf. Which is kind of a oh, cynical way of looking at it, but I've basically said this is a product and it has a shelf life. Yeah. And when I get to the end of that shelf life, they just put a new coat of paint on it and they wheel it back out again. And it's not like, you know, <laughs> running reruns of anything else or not unlike running reruns of anything else or rebranding anything else. It's, it's all they're doing. It's a media ploy that, you know, is a brainwashing technique that we should all be very much aware of and shouldn't be falling for. And I, I don't mean to say that we are. I just mean to say that it's really hard for people when they see it for the first time not to be like, oh, my God, wow, you know, and then become overwhelmed by that. And when you've got these trolls defending him and calling people who criticize it a troll and <laughs> all of these different things that have been going on, it is really hard for the average person looking at it for the first time to make sense of any of it. And that's probably why we keep going in a circle, ultimately. I just, uh, like I said, I, I wish it would stop. I think it's uh, about time we move beyond it or whatever it is we're meant to learn from it, take that and just move on. Well, that's, but that's... It, 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 it's so scattered everywhere that it's, it's very um, understandable. I mean, I have the same thing where, I mean, I've got blogs, I've got podcasts, I've got interviews, and maybe I've said something in one and then explained it a little bit further in another one, but they didn't hear that other one. So they only heard the one. And so they do have to come back to me and ask me that same question again. Right. So there's, there's that aspect yeah. to it and you have to be able to respect that. But at the same time, um, like I, I bumped into it with a friend today where, um, he had said that, he had said something that I had already kind of explained and he just never heard my explanation. So it's not like he's wrong. He's operating on what he has in front of him with a little bit more inf information. He changes his mind. So I guess that's ultimately what we were doing is just adding a little bit more so that people can have the opportunity to make up their own mind. So at the end it of the day, is, I don't really is. care. I don't care. You can believe the yeah. Sphere Wing Alliance are coming to save you all day long. That does not hurt my feelings. <laughs> I have ah, no invested interest in making ass. you disbelieve that. But I'm not going to believe it just to make you happy either. So, it, uh, the, the other aspect to this is what goes on behind the scenes, which is the part that is not talked about because it's not acknowledged. And that is the machine that sits behind it, which is on one level, entertainment, money, showbiz, um, outfits like Gaia that market a certain lifestyle and a certain type of viewpoint that's like everything else. There's a demographic behind it. They understand who their viewers are and they also understand the demographic that they'd like to target next. So, you know, don't think for a minute that they're interested in your enlightenment. They'll give you a little shot of that sometimes, but they're not going to give you the full package because the full package isn't cosmetically very pretty at all. And that's not their interest. But even deeper in lurking behind that chain is just the, the operations that, are, that have been running for a long time and who's paying for them 
and why certain people are fronted to us as so-called leaders and voices and acknowledged. And I will go right into the heart of this because it goes right to David Wilcock. I mean, look, the New York Times bestselling author. I mean, I was just on my uh, Kindle this morning. I was looking at some Audible books and what comes up based on your viewing interest. And there it is, you know, two David Wilcox books sitting right in front of my eyes because I had bought something that was relatively, you know, about consciousness or um, ascension or one of these uh, associated topics that they use when they're when they're parsing data to sell you more product but in the background david wilcox himself is a product of a, of another type that i'm slowly beginning to understand where this guy sprang from and how he was foisted on this alternative media circuit and quite frankly it goes to bill ryan and project Camelot, Project Avalon, and all of these other coast-to-coast, -coast, all of these large outfits that have basically, it's a mixture of things, but at the end of the day, it's convolution of information, and behind it, there sit operatives that when you look at them, you go, hmm, uh, let's see, George Norrie, um, supposedly former naval intelligence, uh, really, and we've outed Stephen Greer, I mean, we've done it. In two shows that, that we've recorded, Stephen Greer was basically cited as being a CIA operative from the time he was 27 years old. So, I mean, these are the people who are top-down leaders in the so-called disclosure movement, and they're being fronted by intelligence operations. And I'm comfortable saying that. You don't have to agree with that. I don't have a problem with it. I'll definitely agree with it. I mean, I think it's it's even documented in, in some, like, especially aspects of ufology, like Mirage Men. I mean, if you don't know what's going on there, it's pretty pretty obvious. Um, yep. There's been uh, there's been a lot of these different, like, things have already been shown. We know that that happens. And what I, I've said, um, I, it's, it's a tough thing to say because I don't want to mention names. But what happens behind the scenes is almost like little powwows of trying to take my information and your information and find a middle ground so that whatever I'm saying to the public doesn't conflict with what you're saying to the public so that we can go talk at the same conference. Yeah. So that if we're both at the same event and we both have to sell tickets for the same event, we won't have infighting at our event. And that's why you see different groups at different events and these different breakups of information and uh, almost like little cliques that form within the alternative community. Um, not to say that not some of them are friendships, because, I mean, you and I both have made friends within the community with other speakers. So it's not to say that some of them aren't real friendships, but a lot of the time it's a, it's almost like a business deal of, um, well, what you're saying lines up with what I'm saying. So could you say a little bit more of this? You know, it's uh, more like someone called it, Sam, a mutual verification club. Yeah. yeah. We'll tweak it just a little bit. To me, it feels a lot like the way things work inside of the Masonic organizations, something that I do know a little bit about. I grew up around Masons, and I saw how they, they operated in business, and I saw the levels of deception that they would tolerate, which were considered, quote, acceptable levels of cheating, acceptable levels of social flattery, and, you know, gratuitous behaviors to the benefit of a lodge brother on a given day to get business contracts or to move things. And then, you know, it moves from there on different levels. Uh, to me, it just smells of that. And it smells as well of just opportunism, which is, again, kind of cynical when you think about the consequences of the things that we've all talked about, which have to do with the dire circumstances on this world. And yet people are making book on it. People are, you know, they're, they're going to first class hotels. They're doing major speaking engagements. They get limos. You know, nobody knows about this. Nobody knows that, that, that certain personalities get picked up at the airport in a stretch limo and taken to their, their, their suite because they don't see that aspect of it. They're not just common people and they're not treated that way. And it can be hard when someone kind of pulls you under their wing and, and puts you up in a five-star hotel and feeds you steak and sushi and 
takes you to these nice places to not want a piece of that for yourself and given the opportunity of creating a story and embellishing said story in order to get a piece of those five-star hotels and steaks and sushi um it's pretty enticing for a lot of people especially people who you know maybe between jobs maybe have to look at a new career goal career direction because of something that's happened in their personal life um this is just natural human behavior it's not rocket science yeah well, that's a kind of an allure but like i said you know we're, we're dealing with serious issues and uh, you know i watched i couldn't watch much of what um because people always say to me you know did you look at this video did you see that and the truth of the matter is I don't have time and I don't really like watching videos all that much. I mean, I'm more of a reader. I'm also in favor of text, which I can speed read real quick to pull in information. But I did watch a little bit of some clips from the health expo out in L.A. where, where Corey and David Wilcox spoke. And I was just, I, I was appalled by the audience. And, I, you know, for me, this was the real tell of seeing how people in the audience just eat this up and the adulation in their eyes. And, you know, they have their iPhones up and they're taking pictures. And it's very obvious they're in altered state, they're in trance, they're consuming information. It is a form of entertainment. It's a form of believism. And, I, you know, it goes back to my whole aspect about a cult because I know what cults are. I've been around them. And part of a, part of a cult is that you're in a trance state. There's a central figure who commands your attention, and that entrains you into a certain belief system that then rules subconsciously your actions on a day-to-day -day basis. And I don't think people realize how much entrainment has gone into this whole industry at this point to get them to a place to be able to buy the kind of things that they're buying. Yeah, and that's where it, it, it gets bigger than just personalities within the the alternative media that's where it gets into the you know the bigger organizations and everything that are behind that and uh, it's something I say even in respects to all of this is that there there's some of us who do have to deal with people that are behind a lot of these type of things and there's some of us who have actually lived in that role and for those of us to swallow this type of stuff whole it becomes very difficult and that's why we get our backs up and that's yeah. why we get yeah. That's why we, we won't take it is because we understand that this is a very real game being played underneath all of the hocus pocus and that needs to be respected. And when we see someone blatantly not doing so, I mean, those of us who've had to suffer for things, it, it hurts. It's, it is upsetting. So there is that part of it being almost personal. But at the end of the day, I think that you know, we're, we're all doing this for ourselves as a collective, not for any one of us individually. And as long as that's true, then we should have everyone's backs, not just our own. Right. Yeah. And it's yeah. it's not it's not that hard to do when everyone is being honest. And uh, I think that the, the organizations that are kind of con con trolling all of these things behind the scenes that the average person wouldn't be able to see, like the, the Masonic groups and various cults that, that influence all of this, they do allow us to kind of create the scenario for them to run with. And with a lot of these things, you know, I've, I've mentioned a few of them by name and there's a lot of others, but they can take this and they can run with it they can make you look crazy for believing anything or make all of us look like just a bunch of crazy people. I mean, I, I do consume a lot of mainstream things. Like a, one thing I watch on a regular basis is uh, Joe Rogan's podcast, which is a very, you know, very popular but a very mainstream um, podcast. And he talks about conspiracies a lot. And a lot of what he's saying makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm not saying I agree with everything he says, but a lot of what he's saying makes a lot of sense. And he's he's also fighting the same fight in his own way, is that when people believe all of this crazy stuff just at face value without any kind of investigation, without any kind of real consideration, it makes it really easy for more people to come along and sell that to you and just keep making that even crazier and making it even bigger and bolder and more CGI and 
more movies. Like, you know, the next thing you know, there's going to be a fucking theme park resurrected for the next Sphere Being Alliance, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Works. You know, like <laughs> Avian Land or like, whatever comes along to replace that because that's going to happen someday. And Corey, I hope you hear me. That's going to happen someday. Someone's going to come along with a bigger, better story than you. And they're going to drop you and they're going to run with that story. That's also going to happen. And that's part of what we have a problem with here. That's a part of the problem is that it's not about the grandeur of the story. It's about what we can take from it and actually do something in our world to change things. Even if that change is just within you, that's, that's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, you know, it wasn't lost on me, and uh, this came up in a number of conversations, because this is, I mean, we're sharing this conversation, but it's really you and I as two friends kind of kicking some things around, Shane. I mean, we're almost a year now from the whole Max Spears thing, and I'm not comparing one with another, except to say that the amount of trauma, confusion, disillusion, cognitive dissonance that rippled through the conscious communities as a result of, you know, whatever happened to Max Spears traumatize people on, on some very personal levels. And it was also manipulated and exploited in ways that, quite frankly, if I had any doubts about certain people's motivations, by the time the Max Spears thing had unrolled, uh, those, those doubts were gone. There was no benefit of doubt left for certain key players because of the way that it was exploited and the shameful way that people behaved. And quite frankly, for the, the journalistic, the lack of journalistic integrity on the part of certain key people who didn't even know how to ask the right questions about the situ situation. You know, so we, we, we have a situation there where we have, you know, a horrible, tragic situation that occurred inside of this big tent media thing that we call the alternative media, the truth movement. And we're watching the opposite side of this now, which is kind of this sideshow effect. But, you know, it's a couple of people who said it. I've had this lingering thing where I'm going, you know, somewhere between all of this, there's always the opportunity for things to go really bad. And I don't want to see that happen for anybody. Definitely not. Um, that whole situation with Max was a big eye opener for me. Didn't know him well, but we kind of started talking a little bit before that. Um, but it was, I, I don't—I could, could draw parallels. Like we're close in the same age, where um, there's definitely some parallels between him and I. And then kind of watching what had happened when all of that went down, all I could do was personalize it for myself and think, sure. "Well, what if that was me?" Because I do a lot of stupid shit. Like I climb cliffs and I go yeah. walking go walking through, you know, interior forests. And I, I do a lot of stuff. Like one day I'm going to get eaten by a fucking bear or fall <laughs> off a cliff and, or drown myself trying to dig something up off the bottom of the lake. And I don't want a bunch of people on the internet speculating about whether or not I was killed for telling the truth or, and I don't want, you know, people throwing up interviews to discuss my death, just to jump on the opportunity and get all those view hits on their YouTube accounts so they can make an extra $3 that month. Uh, I, I, I don't, I didn't, I looked at all of that and I was so disgusted by it all that I, that's a lot of what made me walk away when I was, you know, when I, that's a lot of why I've not been around is I, I, it really disgusted me. Yeah. It really, really, really did. Um, it's the first time I've ever been really, truly disgusted by this community, but I was. And please, nobody listening to me take this personally, unless it's <laughs> unless it applies to you. But the way that that was all handled was was wrong. Yeah. Where it's it's a human being at the end of the day. You have some fucking respect, and they got a family that are going to be hearing all this stuff. Have some respect. Let's you know wait a few days. Let's get all of the facts in place before we start throwing up interviews, speculating about. A bunch of shit we don't even personally know about. We've just taken from people like that. <laughs> Sorry, I <laughs> get a little bit angry there. But, um, you know, it, we need to be able to handle ourselves better than that. That's not even, a, like you said, it's not even true journalism. It's not, no, it's, not. it's not even professional. It's not only is it extremely a, appalling, it's not professional. And, yeah, like, you know, 
people make choices and it's not, those choices aren't always good and sometimes shit happens and, and people die and mistakes get made and all these things are part of life. We, we really have to remember that we are still dealing with human beings here to some extent at least and uh, treat it as such. But that's the business, right? Is you know, they what's everyone going to talk about? We need to be the first people to talk about this. We need to get out in front of this thing. You know, that's that's all common marketing ploys. It's all common it's, branding. It's, it's, it's all, is exactly what it is. It is what drives me nuts. You know, quite honestly, my position has been to to sit back and watch things pass by before I comment on them. I, I don't want to be first. For a lot of reasons. First off, you know, I don't have pretenses about an audience or market share, anything like that. I mean, this was every time we go through one of these debacles, I have encounters with people that quite honestly leave me scratching my head because I was accused by a certain publisher in the alternative media of using this very thing we're talking about to boost my ratings. And I went, well, exactly what would those ratings be? I'm not on a network. I don't monetize my YouTube channel. I've got one little PayPal button on my website that I never even talk about. And the only thing I'm interested in is just doing my little show here and talking with people that I enjoy talking with about things I enjoy talking about and putting out hopefully some information that's not too horribly adulterated. I mean, so it, that there's such a cynical mindset that goes into all of this that it just leaves me, I, quite honestly... You know, I feel soiled after I have that kind of conversation. Um, I, there's many different reasons that people get into this community and stick around and, and do the type of things that you do or the type of things that I do. And it's not always the, the most obvious uh, reasons. And I don't know. Um, it It's draining and it's not as much fun as everyone thinks that it is. And it a is lot draining. of... Yeah. A lot of people are really just doing it because it's like most psychologists. A lot of psychologists are practicing psychology because they're trying to figure themselves out. They're trying to sort out their own story, and that's that's true for me. That is that's true. true. Yeah. Me too. You know, that's me too, man. That's true for for a lot of a lot of us. That's a lot of our motivation here is to, you know, help ourselves and help you while we help ourselves if possible. You know, like uh, I'm sure most people who've ever emailed me have always heard me like or read me respond with, "I'm happy that it helps you," and that's not that was not because that's what I wanted. I set out to do, but as a side effect of the fact that I wrote that fucking thing, yeah. <laughs> if you're if you're somehow helped by that, then that's good, right? Like that's yeah, yeah. that's a good thing. If for whatever reason that made you feel better about your world or helped you, you know, take things out of a box, then then that's great. That's not what I was doing. What I was doing was I have a, a bunch of people that I know personally who were having some issues with some specific topics, and I was looking for a way to communicate to them without sending 100 emails a day. And a blog that I thought would probably never be seen seemed like a good, good way of going about that. So I did it that way. People found it. Now it's got a bigger, it has a bigger audience than I had ever intended. And all I could really do at that point in time is try and be as responsible as I could for that, which was giving people some of my time, giving people my answers when they asked for them. And, you know, I, I, I can walk away from it at any point in time. I feel like it. Whenever I do decide to write anything or come back to it, it's because I have something that I need to sort out. I'm doing it for the same reason you're all doing it. And, you know, I, <laughs> it's a naked high wire act in public is what I've referred to it as. I mean, I, you know, I've done this long enough that I've gone, you know, I've made a fool out of myself a few times. And I've said things that revealed some things that I never intended to reveal. And I've gotten off of the air some nights and threw the headset down and went, I don't think I'm going to do this anymore. You know, there, <laughs> there's blowback. There's blowback when... And energetic levels, emotional levels, psychic levels, name it. I mean, if you do this long enough, you know this, you're going to get hit. Oh, for sure. And like people don't, they, they, they hear what they want to hear and they're going to end up taking what they want from what they hear 
irrespective of what's actually said, which has been a big lesson for me, is it yeah. doesn't matter how clear and concise you are sometimes. It doesn't matter how to the point you are sometimes or how honest you are sometimes. People can take what you've said and put it off into their own direction if that's what they're choosing to do. There's nothing that can be done about that. But that doesn't mean you don't try and be as responsible as you can when you're putting it forward. And it's something like I've, I've seen you do it and, and a lot of other people that I respect are capable of doing this that when we do screw up, we come along and we say, hey, look, we screwed up. <laughs> you know, we screwed up. Yeah. You know? And I think that like what the what the community is is almost longing for when, when this circle comes back around. I think a lot of the people who were like kind of close to it in the beginning, it's almost like they we're waiting for that to be said by someone. Yeah. You know, we're waiting for maybe it's David or maybe it's Corey or we're waiting for someone to just come along and say, look, <laughs> we screwed up, <laughs> you know? And I think that that would make a world of difference if it could ever happen. Um, just some, some accountability from everyone involved. I'm trying to be as accountable as possible. If you don't feel like I am, call me out on it. I'll do my best to be as accountable to it. Um, I've been pretty clear about all of this, where I stand, how I feel. It is just my opinion. I'm no authority, and you don't have to listen to me. So, thanks. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's perf actually the perfect way to wrap it up. Um, you have been posting a little bit, so maybe put that on the end here if anybody wants to see what Shane the Ruiner, a.k.a. Shane Bales, is putting out these days. Yeah, I'll be, like, I'm, I will be writing again. I'll probably start doing a few more podcasts, just not as uh, I was really letting this all consume my personal life to a point where I was hurting relationships around me, yeah. and I'm not willing to do that. Um, if I can't find a way to balance it, then I won't do it. But I'm pretty sure I've got my mind wrapped away a way that I can balance this. So we'll see how things go. Um, I love you all, and I hope that no one ever took any of this personally. It's not. Uh, it's not intended to be. But it's not uh, intended. No. hey, I love you. Every once in a while, we need to take a break from ourselves, and we that's do. that's what that's what I did. We do. So um, we'll put a link up for your for your blog. And uh, Shane, love you, man. Thanks for coming on. Um, I wouldn't have asked you to do this, and uh, I'm grateful that, you know, we put the, this is it, I'm done. You know, we'll put this out there, you can listen to it. I may entertain some comments, but um, the ball stops here. We're not kicking it down the field anymore. The community at large now has enough information to make informed decisions. Go and do it. The truth's inside you. Use it. We're out. Yep. And I love you as well. And uh, if people ever want to know what my thoughts and opinions are, just ask me. There's no reason to speculate. I'm pretty easy to uh, pretty easy to ask questions to. So. We are indeed. All right, we're out of here. Thanks, man.